Welcome to Mornings with Stephen Jardin. Thanks for your company this Friday, the 3rd of May. On the phone in with me, it's expected John Swinney will next week become Scotland's seventh First Minister. I intend to stand for election as leader of the Scottish National Party. What do you want his priorities to be? Call 08085 9295 or text 80295. Watch the programme, we'd love to hear from you. 80295 to get in touch, coming up next. And he says, Our song is a slam scream door, snake and alley tapping on your window. When we're on the phone and you talk real slow, cause it's late and your mama don't know. Our song is a way you laugh. The first date, man, I didn't kiss her and I should have. And when I Taylor Swift ahead of her concerts here next month and a summer full of festivals ahead. We're going to hear about everything you need to know about taking your kids to gigs. Plus... Surgery is here, Nicholas Singleton answering all your questions. If you want some free gardening advice, get your questions in now. Text 80295 and... If you don't want to party, then you should go home. We got this dad and six nine that got it going on. For some, our uh, weekend guide, What's On Guide, is full of low-cost or no-cost ideas for things for you to do. If you've got a community event coming up you want us to share with everybody else, just let us know about it. Text 80295 or email stephen at bbc.co.uk and... Now, you may have noticed them whizzing past you on the roads or pavements recently. It depends where you live, but we're talking about e-scooters. Yeah, we are. That was England three years ago. Since then, they've gone through various trials all over the place. So we're asking, could e-scooters soon be coming to Scotland? All mums and dads striving not for perfection, but just to get by, really. This week we're going to talk birthday parties and Joe Wicks. Your morning's just got better. This year on BBC Radio Scotland. But before all that, it's time for this. <laughs> You think you're rubbish at quizzes, you're hopeless at the chase, you never come close and pointless. Listen up, because our quiz is perfect for you. This morning, two Radio Scotland listeners will go head-to-head -head with me uh, just before lunchtime to claim the Friday showdown crown. It could be you. All you have to do is take a guess at this week's question. It's a true or false. The first people to get it right and who answer their phone will come on with me before the end of the show today to see if they can become the Friday Showdown champion. It will be one of them. It will be one of you. So true or false, Michael McIntyre was on the show at the beginning of the week. He mentioned he lived in Scotland when he studied at the University of Glasgow. True or false, Michael McIntyre on this show, beginning of the week, he mentioned he lived in Scotland when he studied at the University of Glasgow. Is that true or is it false? First two correct guessers who answer the phone will join me at 11.30 to become the Friday Showdown champion for this holiday weekend. Uh, give it a shot. Text your guesses in right now. True or false? 80295. Or give us a call. 08085 92 95 00. Or you can email. It's stephen at bbc.co.uk. <laughs> Oh my God You know Sugar. 
I'm the best when it comes to making love all night Throw your butterscotch body beneath the red light Blaze it up, girl I'ma lace it real tight Go deep till the full moon turn to sunlight Till the darkness is gone Love remains strong like the bond Between mother and child You're so warm to the touch Passionate interludes and such When you're gone Your body's what I yearn to clutch Just imagine ecstasy floating in a cloud Animal attraction burning through the crowd Heaven on earth Paradise for a price It's cool though I'll pay it for the rest of my life You know why? Zones, like a black tiger caged up till you come home yeah. Lovely, you make a man swoon like a boy The love is so soft but gets hard to enjoy Cause the mind flies and sometimes the sex lies Smooth little girls fall in love with rough guys But you could chop a big heart down to pipe size I guess that's what it sounds like when the dove cries uh, The whole world is trapped up in a maze But you save this real good loving for rainy days The Lord works in mysterious ways He must have put you on this earth for all men to praise Become one, indivisible, huh? It's getting critical, son. I'm on the run from love. It chased me out the bed. Get the point, boo. You hit it right on the head. It's an endless adventure. Two bodies collide. King fulfilling dreams with a queen by his side. Forever, infinite time. We intertwine. Destiny. We fall in love by design. What's yours is mine. And what's mine is yours. The road less traveled desires to explore. I adore you. Heavenly angel shine light. Hold my hand. I'll be your God through your night. Glasgow is offering a class for parents of Taylor Swift fans to get them clued up for what lies ahead. This summer sees a string of big concerts, including Glastonbury, Summer Sessions, Transmit and Girls Allowed on Tour and Horse McDonald as well. <laughs> Thank you. So what do we need to know about taking the kids with us to gigs? Yeah, with us live in the studio this morning, Horse singer-songwriter. Morning, Horse. Good morning. Great to have you with us this morning. Um, I went to see Chaka Khan years ago. What I needed to know is oh, the fact wow. she only plays 50 minutes and then she's off. That would be nice, actually. I usually do two hours, but <laughs> but I don't. She's an amazing singer. Well, I would like it. those fifty minutes with it, Chaka Khan. It was worth it. It was worth it. Um, also with us this morning is uh, parent and freelance uh, music journalist Claire Sawyer's. Claire, morning. 
morning. And Jennifer Imrie, a music journalist with all the Taylor Swift knowledge we're going to need. Jennifer, good morning. <laughs> morning. <laughs> right, Clea, as a parent first, do you take your kids to gigs? I have done, yeah. My kid will be three <clears throat> at the end of this month. Um, and I began taking him just in his sling, actually, when he was a baby. Of course, it completely depends uh, on the type of the gig and it depends on the age of your kid. But I don't see why not. If um, if you're into music, why not try and get your child into it as well? You know, it's um, there's something really joyful about going to live shows um, and you can start them out with simple things. You know, there's daytime events where it's totally family friendly no one's gonna give you daggers if you um if your kid starts to rustle about you know i think um it's a lovely thing to share why not uh did you go to gigs with your parents claire music's your life was that where your love of music came from yeah i've got to give a shout out to my mum for that she um w was always taking me to uh, gigs in fact she used to take me to elvis presley fan conventions when i was like quite small um, and, and all kinds of music. She she took me to classical, jazz. It just kind of opened my eyes. And I would say that was a huge reason why I got into music. Um, my dad my dad used to always have on CDs in the car and tapes and stuff. So it was part of my childhood, yeah. What are the considerations if you are taking your child to gigs based on your experience? Well, obviously... You've got to think about like the the child like there's the the basic thing about like kind of volume levels you know i think if you were taking a baby to a taylor swift like huge show in a stadium maybe they would freak out maybe they wouldn't maybe your child's very mellow but um it can be quite overwhelming you know, to... the scale can't it exactly yeah i think you've got to be aware kids hearing is obviously like a, is, is better than ours um uh, they, they might be noise sensitive or even just find the crowds quite overwhelming. It could be like a bit of a sensory overload. So I would sort of use your good judgment about what your particular child individually might find comfortable or not. Um, and then I would maybe inquire a little bit about the venue itself. How family friendly are they? Do they have like changing facilities? Is there like a space where your child could play? It, check what facilities they've got. And I think that's when you quickly realise some places tolerate kids and other places actively welcome kids. And I suppose there's another category where they, they don't make your kids welcome at all. And th if you know that in advance, then you're going to return uh, to the places where they've made your child feel absolutely included in the experience. Festivals are quite a good place to start, aren't they? Because of their open air nature and just the variety of music you get there. Yeah, and loads of festivals now. And um, Kelburn springs to mind. I've got friends that are performing there and bringing their children as well. I mean, obviously, I'm not advocating that children stay up until the small hours, um, you know, uh, drinking or, you know, obviously... It's <laughs> no, got let's be not age. advocate that this morning. <laughs> There's been no mention of age group here, it's just... The... <laughs> I mean, it goes without saying, sometimes, like, live music, that kind of comes with the territory, right? You know, it's there are going to be adults there, but it's, it's like the rest of parenthood is you guide your par you guide your kids, you show them, you know, you, you, you teach them what's what's good for kids, what's just for grown-ups, and I think you, you, you guide them. But, yeah, festivals can be such a fun party experience um, and lots of fam family um, activities are included in festivals now. Uh, stay with me. Horse, in the studio here, do yep. you have children coming to your gigs and do you welcome them, Horse? Absolutely. I, 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 I just basically, when I book shows, um, the venue has sometimes age restrictions and a parent will get in touch and say, oh, it says I can't bring my child. And I said, well, you go ahead and get the tickets and if there's any problems, come back to me. And I think it just depends on the children's age, I think. I, I actually have generations and generations who've come to see me. Um, we were at the Queen's Hall at the end of last year and this man, probably similar age to me, with a big beaming smile goes, do you remember us? And his son is now the same height as him, but when he first came to my shows, he was maybe seven, eight years old. Oh, my goodness. And he loves it. His son loves it. And I can actually communicate with him now. Uh, and we always have a selfie. So they've got generations of selfies with me and them. And I've had parents who came to see me and their daughters and their, 
their families have come. And it's now down to great-grandchildren are coming to see me as well. Do you, you love a music horse. Did that come from early exposure to it through your own parents? I think music is a subliminal thing a lot. I mean, whatever your parents are listening to, you inevitably end up listening to. So I had a real mixture of classical and pop. Uh, and that's perhaps where I am now. Um, and I think there's a broader spectrum of access to music now. Um, so children listen to anything, you know, from cent uh, centuries, decades ago to current music. Um, I just wonder about the Swift, the Swifties um, having to go and the parents having to go and train up um, and learn about Taylor Swift. And I looked about what it was. It was like what to wear uh, and, and stuff like that. And I thought this this is just opportunistic. I think um, I think she is a, a global um, brand and. And, and we, I'm at the, you probably recognise that thing where you, your parents go, I, I don't understand the music you listen to. And and I, I think it happens all the time that there's a, di the, a di disconnect between um, parents and their children, but it's less of a disconnect than it used to be. Right, so we don't need a course for you, but you are touring <laughs> this year. What, what, what do kids, uh, parents who are bringing their children to a horse concert, what do they need to know? Oh gosh, we have to start a course. What they have to know is that um, they have to... Um, no let heckling. themselves. Ah, uh, they're the best hecklers. Um, I, I was really taken aback. We, we were doing a show, uh, a tour. It was last year's show, and um, I saw a young girl in the front seat, and I was like, "Whoa!" I think she must have been eight, something like that. And afterwards, uh, I was in the middle of singing. I went out to the mum and I said, "Do you think she'd like to meet me?" She, said, oh, she would love that. And I was like, "Okay." So we got her backstage afterwards, and I had a photograph. But they came from Glasgow, and we were in Liverpool. Wow. And she wanted to give her daughter an experience. And it was just, so they had a trip and, and the, you know. So with me, it's the full gamut. It's, there are stories, um, there are songs, and I hope that my music is kind of universal. And that's what I'd say, that it's about the music, uh, and I hope that children enjoy it and, and indoctrinate their children. Yeah, and, <laughs> and have a great experience uh, along the way as well. Jennifer Emery joins us on this as well. She's a music journalist with, with all the details on this Taylor Swift thing. Just talk us through it, Jennifer. What is this course? <laughs> what information is it going to be imparting to parents who are going to be going with their kids to see Taylor Swift next month in Scotland? <laughs> To be fair, I am not actually entirely sure. I'm along the same lines as Horse. I don't understand why parents need a course on Taylor Swift. She's been around for years and years and years. If anything, it's the younger kids and the younger generation who won't have been around for her first couple of albums that need the Taylor Swift course more than the parents going. Um, I, I do love that it's become a global thing and kids can go with their mums and dads and mums and dads can go without the kids because... You don't need kids to go and see Taylor Swift. She's not a teeny bopper act. Um, but I do love that it's become more of an inclusive thing well, that people are genuinely stressed about how to take their kids to concerts. My, my first thought was, how much does this cost? <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I yeah. looked it up and it's free. Oh, it's, well. It's free. <laughs> And it's sold out. Ah, well, there we <laughs> so go. So if you were thinking of going to go and uh, gen up on uh, Swifty, then you're in... Uh, they, they probably think you get a ticket for the gig thrown <laughs> in with it as well or something. It's probably been a bit of miscommunication. Uh, Jennifer, what, what do people generally have to think about taking kids to gigs? Well, in your experience, what are the things you have to bear in mind? I feel like the first thing I'd say, especially for Taylor, all the, the TikToks and Instagram posts about your outfits and everybody's jumping about in cowboy boots and high heels. No, we can't, we can't be dancing for three and a half hours in cowboy boots and high, high heels. Get your trainers on, make sure you're comfy. Mm. There's absolutely nothing worse than coming out of a gig, especially a stadium gig, where you then have to trek to the train station, trek to the bus, go back to the car, and your feet are bleeding See, because you've got the wrong shoes on. This is great information. This is what we need, of course. <laughs> Where was this information when I was learning myself? <laughs> to know this stuff. Right, keep going, Jennifer. Next. <laughs> Be comfy. Be comfy is number one. Number two, have something to eat beforehand. None of this running in at the last minute, having, and then you're starving by the end of it. You've got no energy left. Have something to eat before you go. Um, usually venues will take snacks and stuff off of you, but I know for a fact Murrayfield have like food vendors and stuff there. So make sure you've got a couple of pounds in your pocket for chips or whatever to keep you going because it is going to be a long night. <laughs> well, a couple of pounds, excuse me, it's probably more like... <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the chips. Take your credit card. That'll be the yeah, chips. Bank cards. Um, <laughs> and the big question: Is it acceptable to dance in front of your kids when you're at a gig with them? Of course. 
course. My um, my mum took me to my first concert when I was maybe about six or seven. And she said that I was really overwhelmed. I, I remember bits of it. I just remember it was at Steps. And I remember wanting to be Lisa Scott Lee so much that I couldn't even stand up because I couldn't stop looking <laughs> at her. Um, but my mum said that she and her friend, my auntie, um, did all the dancing all night. And I sat there transfixed by the stage. And she was like, well, I wasn't put putting that off putting letting that put me off having a good time and having a dance and as long as you're having a good time everyone else around you will too i think it's all changed i, I think the the parents that we had or the sorry i'm, I'm including you guys but you're probably half my age but um the parents of my time would never have gone to anything like that kind of concert you know and the kind of concerts or the availability or the the kind of spectrum of shows you can go and see is just massive so i think they're more inclined to get involved and i think parents are more children friendly now you know they, they they do more activities together where we were just left to get on with things you know and they did the parent parent type things and we did children type things i think that's changed i remember taking my my son to see the hoosiers brilliant band yes. in princess street gardens in the pouring rain dancing and he turned around and just said don't it <laughs> <laughs> was enough really wasn't it did you ignore him of course. <laughs> never, never been to another gig since then together. Uh, Horse, always such a pleasure That's to have you pleasure, in with us. Thank yeah. you very much indeed. Horse McDonald, singer-songwriter on tour this year and freelance music journalist Claire Sawyers and Jennifer Emery as well with all the Taylor Swift load We're going to be talking a lot, I suspect, about her coming to Scotland next month. Over the next few weeks, right now, 10.25 on a Friday, BBC Radio Scotland. From Tadcaster to Texas, from Cardiff to Chicago, from Manchester to Miami, from Seattle to San Francisco, from New Haven to New York, from Scotland to South Beach, is there anywhere in the world that this show does not reach? The Chris Moyle Show, now live across America. Song. Let's go through. Still coming this morning. Bumbuna, mushroom rice, bag of chips, Cayman Anna, and nine papadums. Good news for Gavin and Stacey fans. James Corden has confirmed uh, online their final ever show is going to air on Christmas Day. We'll have the latest on that a little bit later. And our gardening surgery is here with Nicola Singleton answering all your questions. Whether you're green-fingered or um, a budding beginner, just get in touch with them now. It's 80295 on the text. More is everywhere on BBC Radio Scotland. Yeah. Listen on BBC Sounds. Back to the music. This Friday. you 
on BBC Radio Scotland. It's time to look at uh, gardening surgery with Nicola Singleton. She's with me just after 11 o'clock with free gardening advice. All your questions answered. Get them in now. 80295 or give us a call 08085 925 00. Let's cross live to the potting shed and say hello to Nicola right now. Nicola, morning. Morning, Stephen. I have taken my jacket off today. It's warm. <laughs> Are we ready to declare the frost is over? Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> we might still get a frost, but it's warmed up at last. Thank goodness, thank goodness. Feels really different this morning, isn't doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Which is Sun's good out. news. And good news for National Gardening Week, which we're in right now. Yes, this is National Gardening Week. They have it every year, Stephen. And um, it's just to spread spread the joy about gardening, really, and the wonders that it can, you know, wonders that it performs over. We do that every Friday. That, every week is Gardening Week here. Well, we do. <laughs> <laughs> and also, the, you know, the difference it can make to people. But, yeah, this this the theme this year is a bit cheesy, I have to say. I didn't make it up. Knowledge is flower. So, you know. No, it doesn't work, does it, really? Nah, nah, it's a bit, you know. But it's just, it's trying to debunk all the, you know, oh, you've got to garden in a certain way, there's strict rules to follow. You know, it's really just saying, don't worry about, if something works for you as a gardener, just go with it. And, um, you know, if you ask two gardeners one question, you will get two different answers, Stephen. And you might think that's just me covering my back, <laughs> but <laughs> there's a lot of different ways to do things. So it's just trying to spread the word and say, you know, um, you know, one of the things oh, people worry about, you know, for example, when you're planting stuff, you know, you've got to be really careful with the roots and, you know, don't touch them and be really gentle. But actually, if you're planting a tree or a shrub, you might see me chopping right into the root ball to try and encourage new roots to grow and to get those roots that are already ready there to start branching out. So, you know, sometimes a bit of um, vigour when you're planting and sort of pulling out the roots is actually better for the plant than you know, just be very, very gentle. Obviously, be gentle with the roots of a small sapling, but if it's a tree or a shrub, go for it because you want good roots on everything. Let's bust a few myths, you and me, right now on this then. So so one thing I always understood was when it's sunny, uh, you shouldn't damage, you shouldn't water the plants because it, it would damage them at, at that time. You have to leave it till the sun goes down at the end of the day. Is that true? Yeah, I think it's it's not as true as it's not as much as we used to worry about it. And I think using a fine mist of water over plants, especially when it's quite warm and around about them on the ground and things, really helps to cool things down. So, yep, spraying. I mean, it's it's more water. Uh, you know, it's better in terms of water conservation to do it in the morning or in the evening, just because we use less water then and it doesn't evaporate so quickly. But um, I don't think you have to worry so much about saying, oh, you mustn't water if it's hot. What, so about that's one miss. what about mowing the lawn as well? Because it always used to, you know, you, you shouldn't leave it to grow too much before you cut the lawn. Does it matter? Yeah, well, this is, I mean, this is massive just now, isn't it? The thing about do we cut the grass or not? And no, now there's a huge movement to say leave bits of the lawn a lot longer, let the wildflowers develop, and it's brilliant for wildlife. So we're really changing our minds about that. None of these pinstripe lawns that we used to have. Well, we're into no more May. I've just looked at the date and realised. Here it is again. Back round. All of a sudden, we're back in May. Good excuse not to cut the grass this weekend. Uh huh. Yep, yep. <laughs> or cut bits of it and leave bits long. Compromise. Uh, we can talk a bit more about this uh, after eleven this morning. Uh, but what main thing we're doing is answering uh, all the questions. Free advice here on all things gardening. So maybe this is the first time you're really venturing out into the garden this weekend. Weather looking okay across Scotland. Um, so if you want some advice about planting, maybe you've got some space and you're looking for some ideas what to plant. Maybe you want to really change things. You're just bored and fed up with the garden the way it is and you want some fresh ideas from Nicola um, maybe the grass isn't looking too happy after this winter and so much rain as well window boxes indoor plants we can do it all or rather she can do it all so get your questions in nice and early for Nicola it's 80295 to text us or you can give us a call 0885 92 and gardening starts just after 11 <laughs> Go, hey, little mama, I could transform ya. No, I can't dance, but I could dance on ya. Swiss on the beat, Chris, move your feet. And maybe I could transform you, him to a me. I could change your life, make it so new. 
Make you never wanna go back to the old you So rock in line, give it a little time And she gon' transform like Optimus Prime Need a ride, I can range you up Money, I can change you up You can have your own, no longer be the passenger Swag low, I build you up Knees weak, I stand you up Red lips, red dress, like I'm like a fire truck What you need, you can have that My black card, they don't decline that See potential in you, let me mold that I can transform you yeah. I can transform you, girl, I can transform you Anything you want, I can, I can get it for you Get my baby girl so you know I did it for you I can trans, I can trans, I can transform you You got it, bags, you got it, car, you got it, money, you got it I can, I can transform you, I can, I can transform you Anything you want, I can, I can get it for you You swag surfing What you need, you can have that My black card, they don't decline that See potential in you, let me mold that I can transform you yeah. 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 Anything you want, I can, I can get it for you yeah. I get my baby girl so you know I did it for you yeah. Turn you to a starter Then I take you home And put you on a charger Then, then my car transforms to a charter And we can fly to wherever you ever thought of <laughs> I take you to where it's warm up Then I gotta rip off your dress like a warm up <laughs> But I'm just getting warmed up So tell your man he better get his boat drawn up I transform her to a Ducati Then I transform me to a Bugatti Cause her form Puts me in a trance, I transform smaller and she puts me in her pants. Swiss, Swiss on the beat, Chris, move your feet, and we the transform a good girl to a freak. I can transform you, I can transform you. Anything you want, I can get it for you. I get my baby girl, so you know I did it for you. Seven on a Friday means it's time for this. It's our Friday What's On Guide, packed full of low-cost or no-cost ideas for things for you and the family to do over the course of the weekend. We're going to take you this morning to Thurzo, Blair Gowrie, Alexandria as well, but we're starting line one this morning. It's Frida, Frida Dundas. This is a, a fundraising event, isn't it, Frida, for the RNLI? Good morning. Tell us what's happening. Good morning. The Benham and John Haven Ladies Lifeboat Guild are having a new to you sale in the Village Hall from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. Right, so what are we going to have? We're going to have books, we're going to have clothes, toys, what else? Everything except electricals. We've got books, some toys, lots of clothes. R and I souvenirs uh, and teas. And teas. Very, teas and cakes. Yeah. Very but I knew there'd be cake. I suspected that probably. Now this is a fundraiser for the RNLI. So important to our coastal communities. Your husband's a fisherman, I think, isn't he? Yes, that's correct, he is. So so you know, it matters. It really matters what the RNLI do and it's getting harder and harder to get volunteers and to recruit for things like this. So every penny counts, Frida. It does. And we, we also um, we would welcome new recruits to, to the guild as well, um, boys and girls. Um, yeah. Okay, so it's the Village Hall. It's tomorrow from 10 till 4. Uh, how much to get in? 
It's two pounds for adults, seventy five p for children, and that includes the tea and coffee. Okay, and the cake. And- and cake. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just checking. Frida, have a good day tomorrow. I hope it goes well. Uh, let's go to line two this morning, Yvonne Rathbone. This is Craft North, uh, an event in Thurzo taking place. I think it starts today, this Yvonne, doesn't it? Hi there, yes. Yeah, so welcome to Cavenet. Tell us what's happening. Right, um, I'm part of the Craft, Craft North team with my friend Bronwyn and with Thurzo Community Development Trust. We put on the street market to give the town a bit of a burst. We've also got a cruise ship in that scrubs the harbour. So Tanya and the crowd there are sending them all down here. We call it a stroll through the craftsmanship of the Highlands. I like We've it. We've got 22 stalls over two days in the um, high street, which is the pedestrian area of town, nestled in between the lovely local shops. So... It is really a stroll through the craftsmanship of the Highlands. And what crafts can we see? Who's doing what, Yvonne? Well, I'm going to give a shameless plug to myself. <laughs> I was just in the middle of a sale, actually, when you called. Um, I paint glasses. Um, I'm Abby Crafts. We've got home fragrances. We've got spellbound case nests with their magical, mystical um, products. We've got jewellers. We've got uh, silversmiths. We've got woodwork. In fact, you name it. You've got it all covered. Did you get the sale yeah, finished? We haven't, did you get the money? OK, say did, again. Did you get the sale finished? Did you get the money? Um, no. Oh, well, that's no <laughs> I good. Mentioned, I mentioned you and she ran off. And Well, that happens. <laughs> well, run after her and get, get the money. Uh, it's taking place today and tomorrow. What are the times, Yvonne? Right, we're here today from half past ten and the same tomorrow till 10.30. Good luck. Oh, no, get me oh, hang get on. that right again. Go on, go on, have We're another here go. from 10 till about 4 o'clock today and tomorrow. It's totally free. You can probably hear the music playing. We've got street musicians there. Um, and we've got our visitors from France in today. They're on the cruise ship. And tomorrow from Germany. Oh, how's your so French and German? Um, ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. That's a little bit, that's it. And the French? Uh, je ne parle pas français. Excellent. This is going to go well, isn't it? Go and get your money, <laughs> Yvonne. Good luck this weekend. Craft North in Thurzo taking place this weekend. Uh, that sounds fun, doesn't it? Line three this morning. Uh, Georgie Hill, event coordinator, Meagle and Ardler Community Development Trust, Beltane Festival. Spring is here, Georgie. Good morning. Morning. Tell us about it. Um, so we are um, the Meagle and Ardler Community Development Trust. Um, and we were born just post-COVID to support the mental and physical well-being um, of the local communities, um, trying to get people back out there. And we are doing Beltane, um, which is an event based um, on our community trail. So we are going to have some poetry. We're going to have um, storytelling. We're going to have barbecue. Um a bonfire, we're going to have a silent disco um, lots of fun things to do um, we did it last year and it was so successful that we just wanted to expand on it and we've had so much support from the community um, and the Belmont camp and actually the Negro Country House um, who actually donated some um, bunting for us and made some knitting um it's, we've gotten everyone involved and we are really excited to see how it turns out That's tomorrow. Brilliant. There was a big Beltane event in Edinburgh this week as well. It's all about the start of spring, isn't it? It's about fire, it's about light. What can people expect, Georgie? Um, we can, people can expect um, lots of laughs, absolutely. Um, you know, dancing around in the forest. We have a piped procession starting at 3pm. Um, we are going to have poetry from um, poets Beth McDonough and Jim McIntosh. Um, what else have we got going on? We've got lots of little crafts for people to do, take part in. Um, it's all on the website, isn't it? How can people get more information? Where should they go? So if people would like more information, they could head to the Meagle and Ardler Development Trust Facebook page or the Eventbrite um, page which our links are on our posters 
and you can get all the information about what to expect and timings and everything else that will be involved in the in the day. Good luck to you, Georgie. Hope it goes well. Line four, let's wrap this up in Alexandria. Shan Wilkie is the organiser of the market that's taking place there tomorrow. Uh, Shan, morning. Morning. Tell us all about it. Yeah, so this is a relaunch of a community-focused um, market in Alexandria. Um, so we're sort of heavily... Um, promoting local businesses um, and just trying to get the community to come back down into the town. So it's next to the community centre um, tomorrow between 10 and 2. It's free. Um, lots of activities, sort of e-bikes, um, face painting. There'll be some buskers, there's some entertainment, there'll be some street food. So, yeah, just a nice community event to get people back into the town centre. When, when was the last time you did this, Sean? We did it last year. We had a kind of slow run last year to try and establish something which kind of was a bit hit or miss so this this is the sort of relaunch to get people back into the town brilliant so it's been, got 19 stalls coming um, yeah we've got entertainment this time we've got e-bike demonstrations we've got a lot more happening around it to sort of encourage like a family day out and you've got good weather as well well done arranging like that <laughs> yeah uh, I hope it goes well get yourselves down there if you can Alexandria Market uh, it's at the Overton Car Park 10 to 2 uh, tomorrow. Um, if you've got an event coming up you want to share with the rest of Scotland, just let us know about it and we will pass it on. You can text 80295 or drop us an email. It's stephen at bbc.co.uk. Join us for Memphis Wrestling Live. Next Friday, May 3rd, Memphis Wrestling returns to West Carroll for a huge fundraiser benefiting the West Carroll Touchdown Club. Save $2 when you purchase your tickets in advance. Sunday, May 5th, WWE legend Brooklyn Brawler is coming to Memphis Wrestling. Plus, Buff Bagwell and Scotty Riggs along with GCW World Champion, Blake Christian. Thursday, May 9th, don't miss Bump and Grind Wrestling 2 at Lafayette's Music Room in Memphis, featuring James Ellsworth, Beer City Bruiser, and more. Saturday, May 18th, Dustin and Maria invite you to their gender reveal event. It's free. Reserve your seat and pick your side blue or pink. Sunday, June 2nd, Kick Cash is coming to Memphis Wrestling. All tickets are on sale now. Get yours right now at memphiswrestling.tv. with Stephen Jardin still to come before 12 o'clock. For all the mums and dads out there striving not for perfection but just to get through another week, this week we're going to talk about kids' birthday parties and Joe Wick's advice on using knives. And our gardening surgery is coming up with Nicola Singleton. The advice is free. All your gardening questions answered. Just text 80295. On BBC Radio Scotland. Got a doll, baby. I love her so. Nothing else like her anywhere you go. A man, she's anything but calm. A regular pint size, I had a bomb. Got a mom, baby, had a bomb. I want her in my wigwam. She's just the way I want her to be. A million times hotter than TNT. Adam Bomb Baby, loaded with power, radioactive as a TV tower, a nuclear collision in her soul, loves with the electronic control. Adam Bomb Baby, little Adam Bomb, I want her in my wigwam. 
she's just the way I want her to be. A million times harder than TNT. Bum, Leona, bum, Leona, bum, Leona, bum, Leona. Atom bomb, baby, boy, she can start. One of those chain reactions in my heart. A big explosion, big and loud. Mushrooms me right up on a cloud. Atom bomb, baby, little atom bomb. I want her in my wigwam. She's just the way I want her to be. A million times harder than TNT. Bum, Leona, bum, Leona, bum, Leona, bum. Adam Bomb, baby, sweet as a plum Carries more wild than uranium When she kisses, there's no hitch Zero power, she he turns on the switch Adam Bomb, baby, little Adam Bomb I want her in my wigwam She's just the way I want her to be A million times harder than TNT Adam Bomb, baby, little Adam Bomb I want her She's just the way I want her to be A million lives harder than TNT Ten fifty on a Friday. Anyone who's been on a European city break in the last couple of years will have seen them in their droves. E-scooters are a quick way to get around and a cleaner option than the car. But they've also been blamed for a string of accidents. Rome and Paris are both cracking down on their use. But could they be coming to Scotland? Let's talk about this first with the Scotsman's transport correspondent, Alistair Dalton, who joins us this morning. Alistair, morning. Good morning, Stephen. What are the current rules for e-scooters in Scotland? They're basically illegal, uh, all types, on uh, roads and pavements. And the only place you can use them legally is private land with the owner's consent. So, for instance, when I tried one out that was brought over for for a testing, we, we used it in the office car park with the consent of the building manager. And yet we um, see them everywhere. They, we see them everywhere at yeah, the moment, don't we? Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. And um, I specifically asked uh, the Transport Secretary, Fiona Hislop, about this, about whether the police were turning a blind eye. Uh, and the, the Police Scotland's response to me didn't sound like they were taking a terribly proactive approach. They said if there were concerns or reports, they would um, provide an appropriate response. There have been trials taking place down south of e-scooters. How have they been going? Well, they've been going since 2020 and are being extended further to 2026. So I think the UK government, who are responsible for whether they should be ultimately legalised, uh, haven't decided on the merits of their, their safety. Um, they've been very popular. Um, there's been um, millions of journeys taken in about um, 40 areas. Um, there have been some incidents, but I think most uh, injuries and crashes have taken place where people are using privately owned scooters rather than the ones in the rental trail. The, the rental trail, there's, there's restrictions. You have to be, I think, 18 in, in many of the, the areas. You have to have at least a provisional driving license. So it's not just anyone or any age who, who can use them. They've been very popular, um, mostly for people commuting to work but there is concern that uh, it's reduced the amount of walking and cycling people might otherwise do talk us through the pros and cons of them alistair what are the arguments surrounding e-scooters well first of all they're, they're a fun thing to use they're very zippy uh, they're relatively easy to master i found it was um, a little bit you needed to to sort of get get your balance a bit uh, but probably less um less forbidding than if you weren't weren't terribly um good at, at cycling so it's so very, very accessible um very easy to use you've you basically just got an accelerator on one of the handlebars um uh and um, if they're available on the street, um, uh, very sort of user-friendly, accessible. Uh, cons are that although in the trials in England they are legal on pavements, there is there will be a tendency for people to want to use the pavement away from cars and other traffic. 
potholes and so on. And there's the obvious potential conflict with pedestrians, particularly as these e-scooters can travel up to about 15 and a half miles an hour. And they're not licensed and they're not insured in the way that a motor vehicle would be. Uh, in the trial schemes in England, the, the, the insurance, I, I believe, is through the operators. Uh, but that's the reason why they are legal to, for private use uh, anywhere in the UK, because if you got caught, you would be um, charged with driving without insurance and face a fine of several hundred pounds and, and six penalty points, potentially. Got you. Alistair, stay with me. L let's look at the picture where they have been operating and cross live to Paris. Francis Collings is a freelance journalist based there. Francis, morning. Thanks for your time this morning. Good morning, Stephen. Are you a fan of e-scooters? Uh, I am a big fan personally. I used to use them a lot until they were uh, outlawed uh, in a referendum, which was about a year ago, brought in by the mayor and Hidalgo, and then the, the ban came in last September. Uh, so, yeah, very convenient. A lot of people use them, but at the same time, all the concerns that you've been discussing were becoming something of a political issue here in Paris. And essentially, I think the referendum that Anne Hidalgo held was, was a political move because there were so many complaints from a, a lot of people based on scooters not being used in the right way. I mean, when they first came in, I think in 2018, I used to come out of my house and you would see a little knot of them on the pavement or on the road. There'd be a little untidy pile. You could grab the, the least battered one and take off. And then they, they tightened that up and brought in uh, specific areas that were painted on the road where you had to leave them at the end of your ride. But it still wasn't ideal and there was still a fair bit of zipping around on pavements or through parks. And quite often what I'd see, and again, it wasn't really policed at all, was two people on a scooter. Uh, which was highly illegal, but the police did nothing about it, it seemed, and now we don't have them. Uh, have they gone away since the ban was introduced? I mean, they're, they're not supposed to be in use here uh, on public mm. roads, but they are. Have they disappeared in Paris? Well, they're still legal to, to use if you have a private one here, which is uh, different to, to where it is uh, in the UK. So you can zip around on your own one. Um, a lot of people do, but certainly the numbers of people on scooters has decreased. I mean, one of the benefits of Paris is that since uh, Hidalgo became mayor in 2014, the number of cycle lanes across this city uh, has increased enormously. I mean, I think 50 kilometres popped up during the pandemic, which stayed permanently. So there's a lot of very safe places to go on a scooter, to travel on a scooter. So yes, when you're stepping across the road, I've become used to in Paris, not just looking right and left, but also checking the cycle and scooter lanes as well. Francis, based on the experience in Paris, if we are considering about having them here, what do we need to know, to know and how maybe could the problems be avoided that you faced over there? Well, the proliferation of, of areas for scooters and bicycles, cycle lanes, is really important. The other thing is, is that you don't have many complaints about the, the bicycles that are now on the streets, electric bicycles, uh, ones provided by, by the Paris government and ones provided by private companies who used to give us the, the scooters because you have docking stations. You, you take your bike out of a docking station, you use the app, you cycle, you put it back into a docking station somewhere else. That never happened with scooters. If you have it policed whereby you are taking a scooter from one location and putting it back specifically to another location. So you avoid piles up, you avoid people chucking them in the river, which is what's happened before. Uh, that will take away a lot of the, the angst over these, these scooters and also keeping people using them legally to, to cycle lanes. And if someone's on the pavement, you have to prosecute, you have to find them because otherwise we have situations as we've had here, as we've had elsewhere, where people can be badly injured and can be killed by being hit by a scooter, as you say, that goes up to 15 miles an hour. Based on all that uh, and the greener alternative they are to the motor car, do you think we should give them a go here in Scotland? I really do. I do think it's the future. I think uh, the future of transport uh, is what we're beginning to see in a lot of European cities, certainly here, an integrated system. We have new trams appearing here, new train lines appearing, uh, electric bicycles appearing everywhere, cycle lanes, as I mentioned, and scooters, for me, if they're policed properly, are part of that integrated system. 
Francis, thank you so much for your time this morning. Live from Paris, Francis Collings, freelance journalist. And we heard from the Scotsman's transport correspondent, Alistair Dalton. I've got a statement here from Police Scotland. E-scooters can only be legally used on private land with the permission of the landowner. Their illegal use can impact local communities. Anyone with concern should contact us so an appropriate policing response can be provided. We also urge anyone purchasing an e-scooter to be aware of the law, the implications of using one in a public place, their classified as personal light electric vehicles subject to the same legal requirement as any other motor vehicle, meaning they must be insured and drivers uh, must have a driving licence. We'll keep across this story and see where this goes after the news at 11 o'clock this morning. It is our gardening surgery. Nicholas Singleton is here with free gardening advice ahead of the long weekend. So if you've got a question about growing, about lawns, about window boxes, whatever it is, get in touch now it's 80295 to text the show with Stephen Jarden on BBC Radio Scotland. Thank you for your company this Friday, the 3rd of May, bank holiday on Monday. Let's get you in the mood for the big weekend. Inch by inch, roll by roll. <laughs> Five minutes time, Nicholas Singleton lining up with free advice. Whether you're green fingered or a budding enthusiast, we want to hear from you. Margaret, Pamela, Liz, all lined up, but it could be you too. Just text us your questions, 80295, or give us a call, 08085 929500. Wow, what do we have here? Mornings on BBC Radio Scotland. Four o'clock, twelve o'clock.
Friday morning. I've got the key. It's big and it's rusty and I'm using it to open up the potting shed this morning. And oh, look who's inside. It's Nicholas Singleton, our gardening expert, waiting for us. <laughs> Patiently. I love the rusty key. Yeah, <laughs> it's always rusty, <laughs> it's isn't always it? Rusty. Anything to do yeah, with the garden, yeah. it's always rusty. Now, Nicola <laughs> wants to talk this morning about dahlias and early spring shrubs, but no time because we're so busy with questions for you this morning, Nicola. Um, Eight oh two nine five. That's what you're here for every Friday. <laughs> Eight oh two nine five. I suspect because it is a holiday weekend for a lot of people. Big gardening plans. Still time though to join the queue of, uh, queue of questioners. Oh eight oh eight five ninety two. 95 00. Would you like to go to Stirling first this morning, Nicola, or Gurick? Oh, I don't know. Stirling is closer, maybe? Let's try <laughs> Stirling. Margaret is there this morning. Morning, Margaret. Morning, son. Morning. What's your question for Nicola? Well, this is a first for me because I, I've never heard of this before, but I'm assuming you this is true. I have got. I've always had a big garden. In fact, I had Jim McCall here one time. But I found something in my flower bed, the border in my front lawn, and it looked like perfect pencil mark holes. And I thought maybe it was worms. And you know, you're not going to believe this, but it's wasps. Really, I've seen it for myself. Somebody told me it was wasps under the earth. And I noticed they were, they were um, just hovering around the, the edges of the border, about just to 10, 12 inches out. They were only going to do it. And then I seen two of them going into these holes. <laughs> and I don't know what to do with wasps in the ground. They are really good. Oh, yes, that's, that's, I believe you, Margaret. Honestly, I you believe do. you. Thank God for yes. that. I've never heard. Yep, yep, yep. In fact, it's funny, I was just talking to a few people about bees yesterday and um, although these look like wasps, I'm I'm thinking that they're actually probably something called a mining bee. Yeah. Um, that's the mo they, they look a bit thinner than a like a bumblebee type bee, so you might think that they look like wasps. And um, this is actually a really good thing in your garden, Margaret, and it's not anything really to worry about. So if it sounds like it's a mining bee and what these are is a type of bee but instead of living you know we know about um you know honeybees in a hive and things like that they actually are what are called solitary bees so they don't all live together but they live like close to each other so they live close enough that they can mate but they um they actually live in these little burrows that they make in the ground and um they're really a good thing for your garden um, they'll only you'll only notice them, Margaret, for probably about um, I don't know four or five weeks while they're active just now because they're wanting to breed, um, and then they'll just disappear. So after four or five weeks, you won't even notice that they've been there. Um, they're not interested in you, and they won't. Um, you know, if you just leave them to it, they won't bother you in the slightest. But the good thing is that these are actually one of you know. Oh, we talk about the bees and pollination looking after the plants. So these are actually really useful pollinators in the garden. When they go um, from flower to flower collecting their nectar and they transfer pollen, then they do a really, really vital job in the garden. And also they, they'll slightly help to aerate the ground with these little burrows. So I would be telling all your friends that you've got quite a special event going on in your garden, Margaret, because <laughs> you've got these really precious mining bees that have decided that you've got a nice habitat for them. And um, there's, I mean, if you're really worried, you could maybe put some, I don't know if you've got some pots of mint or lavender or something that's got a strong smell. It might sort of deter them a little bit. But to be honest, if it was me, I would just enjoy watching them and be quite chuffed that they've chosen your garden to, to you know, have their home in for this spring. What do you think, Margaret? I, I, I'm happy I spoke to Nicola because I got my next door neighbour to phone Amazon yesterday and ordered this free. Oh! Uh, hi, so I don't put it in the holes. She won't like that. No, 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 no. And, and right. well, got... I'm, I'm so glad I spoke to you because that's what I was going to do and I wouldn't do it deliberately to kill anything. But, no, they're really useful in the garden, Margaret. They do a really important job, so I would just appreciate them and enjoy them and they won't bother you. So just, just you know, enjoy watching them. But please don't oh. exterminate them. <laughs> Thank you so much. No problem, Not Margaret. Send... I hope I can send that stuff back to Amazon. I'd be paying £12 for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you send it back, Margaret. Let's save the bees. You just saved the bees, Nicola. I hope so. I hope so. And these are, you know, quite spe- they are solitary bees, so they're a bit more, you know, interesting in terms of you don't get as many, I don't think, as the other bees. So, you know, appreciate them. If you hadn't definitely. stepped in, that would have been an extinction event. Well done, you. Uh, friend <sighs> of the gardener and you. the bees. <laughs> right, let's go to Gurik for the next question. And we, we love questions like this. Uh, next one is from Pamela this morning. Morning, Pamela. Morning. Morning. What's your question for Nicola? Well, what I say, I've just moved into a bottom flat two weeks ago. And out up in the back there, there's a small patio. Now, there's different pots in, that, in the patio, but there's nothing in them. They're obviously died off. Um, I've got six stairs going out to the main gate that I could probably put pots on. Uh, it doesn't get much of the sun. Uh, maybe later on in the day it gets the sun. Uh, I'm also visually impaired, so I would like something with a wee bit of smell, you know, yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. Let's get some ideas for Pamela. What do you think, Nicola? Okay, brilliant, Pamela. So, um, first of all, it's great that you want to actually brighten up the area. Um, uh-huh. The pots that are there, you'll probably it'll probably be a good idea to get yourself some fresh compost because the uh-huh. pots that have been there, have, they've probably been there a wee while, and you don't right. know what's been in them. So, you, if you can start off with some fresh compost, uh-huh. um, and if you if you're thinking about, and if you've already got a lot of pots, that's great. And I was going to say, if you're thinking about other ideas, mm-hmm. you could always get some maybe some recycled things that you can just as long as something's got a hole in the bottom, you can always use it as a planter uh-huh. um but things that would give you um interest from kind of now onwards i would uh-huh. say try and put in try and put in a mixture of things that will give you summer color but also things that will give you like permanent I think it's color color right now. you know it's, it's the uh-huh. on one yeah. wall mm-hmm. well i would i would be looking for things that are going to give you sort of flowers quite quickly. So um, when you're saying about uh, getting scented things, then we're definitely going to mention lavender. We have to mention lavender. So many different herbs have got great flowers through the summer. So things like um, thyme, lavender, rosemary, they'll all they'll all do really well in pots. Um, and even if it's not that sunny, you'll still get the scent from them. And if you sort of brush the foliage, you'll still get the scent. So things like that would be great. Um, you might want to put in a few little ivies because they'll last right through the winter. And um, although they're not scented, they're, they're going to give you colour right through the year. And perhaps some small heathers might be good to go again for, you know, sort of colour at the other times of the year. And then for summer colour, if it's a bit shadier, I would say things like uh, fuchsias and begonias will do really well in that sort of situation. And they flower a long time, kind of right into the autumn as well. So I think just think about a bit of a mixture of things. And you'll also get, um, you know, say, for example, if you put some begonias in that were trailing, um, then you might want to have maybe an upright fuchsia in another one and maybe some some thyme that's going to sort of trail over the edges. So it's just thinking about sort of textures as well. So um, there's loads of things you can you know, have a have a go with. Make sure that you replace your compost with fresh stuff. Make sure the drainage holes are clear. Sometimes if a pot's been sitting for a long time, the drainage holes can get bunged up a bit. So um, just make sure they're clear before you start and just have a wee go. Remember that um, when you plant in the summer, you plant quite thinly so that things have got space to grow. When we talk about planting in the winter, we always say, oh, you know, cram it quite full. But if you put things like um, perhaps fuchsias or ivies and things in just now, they're going to get really vigorous and grow right through the summer. So you want to leave them a bit of space to grow. So don't go crazy in terms of what you have to spend. Um, you know, make sure you leave space for stuff to grow. Water them well and um, I hope you have a, a lovely display in the summer. How does that sound, Pamela? Thank you very much. Good luck with it. Let us know how you get on. We'd love to Hello. hear back. Yeah, thank you, thank Pamela and Gurek this morning. 80295, if you want to text your questions in or give us a call to speak directly to Nicola, it's 08085 Karen is in Kinghorn in Fife this morning. She says, what's the best season for growing tomatoes? Do I need a greenhouse to do them here in Scotland? 
Hmm. Okay, this is peak time for getting tomatoes started. Um, and I would say get them started now, but you can, if you've got, you can get outdoor varieties. So if you shop around, you'll be able to get outdoor varieties that will do a bit better. But I think the, the main thing to say is if you haven't got a greenhouse, um, it might be that you can grow a bush variety on your windowsill, or you might want an outdoor one that you could position if you've got perhaps a, a really sheltered spot, maybe a wall or a patio or the wall of the house somewhere like that you could give it a go because it gets direct sun and it's it's perhaps um you know on a wall they'll do they'll do pretty well there you just need to look at the varieties that would do better outside so there's one called um, that springs to mind outdoor girl is a good one but i would definitely give them a go and if you think um outside is maybe going to be tricky then maybe this year try two or three bush ones on the windowsill see how you get on with them and then um, you could maybe be a bit more adventurous next year but there's so many tomato varieties you would not believe it you can get yellow orange pink stripy you know the traditional red all sorts of shapes and sizes so it's definitely worth giving it a go good luck karen uh yeah let us know how you get on liz in dornach yeah. this morning can you help i'm struggling to get my carrot seeds to germinate this year after two seedings is it possible the polytunnel that i've got is too hot Okay, Liz. Well, carrot seed can be tricky. So it's probably not anything that you're particularly doing wrong. I mean, the polytunnel, it potentially can get too hot on these sunny days that we've been having. I know they've been scarce, but, you know, the temperatures can get, get really warm. If it's a thin tree and it's perhaps black and it's sitting in right, right in the sun, it can get quite warm. Um, but I would say also, on the other hand, it might be have been too cold for them to germinate. So I would... I would say that it's definitely worth trying again. They can be quite slow, so sort of allow two or three weeks for them to come up. Make sure that the compost isn't too wet either, because sometimes the seeds will, um, you know, if it's too wet for too long, they'll just rot away, nothing will happen. So check in the temperature, check in the moisture. Um, if you if you try some now and then after about another four weeks, try another batch so that you've got carrots coming at different times. They're not all going to be ready at once. And sow them really as thinly as you can. Um, ideally, sow them where you want them to, to grow because um, they don't really transplant terribly well. Um, so I think it's possibly been a combination of temperature, possibly too wet, but I would definitely definitely give it a go because it has warmed up it's kind of a bit more you feel it's you feel the air is warmer it's not going to be so cold at night now so that's going to make a big difference to plants and on that basis so give us our taste. gardening jobs for the weekend nicola oh and it's a long weekend Stephen. so two, i'll give you two jobs i'll give you two jobs um so the first one i'm afraid you're going to have to start weeding it's time to get out there and get up you know really start to try and get a hold of the weeds um whether it's hoeing whether it's hand weeding whether it's um you know putting mulches down if you can make a start now it's going to make a big difference to the you know the season for you and um the second thing and i'm really guilty about this is um start tying in your climbing plants so things like your climbing roses your clematis that are all starting to come really into full growth now your honeysuckle try and make sure you get them trained along your wires or your trellis or whatever get them tied in with a nice bit of twine because it'll make a huge difference to them and it'll give you you'll probably actually get more flowers because they're going to be well supported and the branches are going to be you know a bit happier and a bit more supported they'll they'll do well and you should get more flowers so a couple of nice you know not that relaxing but doable jobs this weekend Stephen. Nicola happy gardening to you have a great weekend we'll catch you next Friday for gardening surgery in the programme right now we're at 11.24 on a Friday morning with Stephen Jardin I'm here until 12 then it's lunchtime live Hayley Miller's on the show today Hayley morning what's coming up good morning Stephen well we've still got uh, our eye on all the politics going on because uh, John Swinney really looks uh, like he's going to become Scotland's next first minister now after Kate Forbes uh, said she wouldn't challenge him for the leadership um, she is uh, expected to uh, do an interview at some point today so we'll be looking at the latest there also down south the local uh, elections in England uh, are coming in uh, will they be the sort of hammering for the Tories as it was thought they might be. Well, they're not all in yet, but uh, we will look at what the latest is there. Also, Labour has won the Blackpool South by election. 
and taking that seat from the Conservatives. Also be interesting to see just how much of an inroad the Reform Party might be making into the Conservatives' vote. And uh, away from politics, uh, we're going to be looking at this continuing problem of this rack concrete, aerated concrete, because homeowners now say they're living in fear of crippling bills and very little support after it's been found in their homes. So uh, we'll be hearing uh, from people who are likely facing, you know, a substantial bill for this and having to foot the bill themselves if they own their own home as opposed to being uh, tenants. So lots more on that. Uh, and lots more to come, all from 12. We look forward to it, Healy. Thank you very much. Right now, 11.25 on a Friday, BBC Radio Scotland. Action. Sweat. Competition. Ultimate challenge. Here. Now. American Gladiators. American Gladiators, Saturday at 10 on Fox 64 catch that over the weekend. Uh, tomorrow morning from 10, you can catch Shireen right here, looking back on the week's events in politics and what it will mean for the future of the SNP as well. And also asking tomorrow, is the ideal movie running time really 92 minutes? All that and more with Shireen tomorrow morning from 10 on BBC Radio Scotland. Almost 8 million people listen to our show. This is Education Week. Mornings on BBC Radio Scotland. You're on a Friday time for this. Showdown quiz contenders for this morning. Uh, I asked you earlier at the top of the show to guess true or false. Michael McIntyre joined us on the programme at the beginning of the week and he told us that when he lived in Scotland, he studied at the University of Glasgow. Well, the answer is false. He studied at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, two listeners got it right this morning. They answered their phones when we called them back. Agnes from Stirling first this morning. Morning, Agnes. Good morning. Are you good at quizzes, Agnes? Uh, not really. Excellent. You'll be perfect for this then this morning. Do you do pub quizzes? Do you watch Pointless Countdown, things like that? Yeah, things like that. I watch um, some quizzes on TV, but I don't pretend to be any good at them. OK. No, you're ideal for this quiz then, Agnes. You stay right there. Here's Paul and Elgin, who's up against you this morning. Morning, Paul. Morning, Stephen. Morning. Are you a good quizzer? Uh, I'll tell you in about five or ten. <laughs> do you do pub quizzes, Paul? Do you like to get involved? I, I used to, but not, not so much now. But I do, I do try and watch some on the TV. Oh. But uh, I wouldn't again, the same as Agnes. I wouldn't be a mess, but not great at it. I think you're pretty evenly matched, you two. This is going to be fun this morning. Here's how it's going to work. I'm going to ask you three questions relating to this week's news. Whoever gets the most right becomes our Friday showdown champion, goes on the leaderboard here in the studio in Glasgow. You've got a short time to answer. I'll be watching the clock, and if it's still even after three questions each we'll do a tiebreaker to decide it all the questions are based on things that we've covered on bbc scotland this week so hopefully you've been paying attention let's find out who's going to be this week's friday showdown champion Agnes, you're up first this morning. Uh, the Scottish First Minister, Hamza Youssef, announced his resignation this week. On which day did he do it? Was it A, Monday, or B, Tuesday? Oh, Monday. Monday, correct. Well done. One point to you, Paul. A famous female artist known for her James Bond No Time to Die track announced the release of new music and a UK tour as well this week. Who is it? Is it A, Adele, or B, Billie Eilish? Is it Adele? No! No, it's not.
it's Billie Eilish. Uh, her tour starts in September. I thought that was a hard question. I'm on your side for that, Paul. So but, did I. Uh, let's go around to it. Still all to play for, though. Uh, time for the second. This is our sound round. We'll pay, play a clip and ask you a question relating to what you've just heard. Agnes, here's your clip. <laughs> This week, Jeff Lynne uh, announced the death of the keyboard player that he'd played with down the years, Richard Tandy. But which band were they in together? And we just played a clip of them. What's the name of the band? Oh, oh my husband's going to be annoyed at I can't remember. I do know the band and I just can't think of it. Oh. Do you want to have a sorry. guess? No, sorry. I'd give So I'm not going to. It was ELO, Electric Light Orchestra. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay, yeah. right. So, Paul, all to play for here. Here's your clip. Marks what iconic science fiction movie day f uh, for what franchise? What's the name of the movie franchise? Uh, is it Star Wars? Of course. Yes! Even Stephen, one each at the moment. Final round, all to play for. Agnes, what former Prime Minister was turned away from their local polling station yesterday after forgetting to bring their voter ID? Former Prime Minister turned away from their local polling station. Who could it be? Boris Johnson. <laughs> I don't know. Good guess. Yes! Sure. Turned away. Right. It's all on you, Paul, on this one. Which male comedian has been in the headlines this week after having to cancel his upcoming gig in Manchester due to the arena still being under construction? Male comedian had to cancel his concert because the arena in Manchester, it's been all over the news, this, still under construction. But who is he? Peter Kay. Peter Kay. It's going to go to the tiebreak this week. It is neck and neck. Here's your tiebreak question. First person to answer this correctly is our winner this week. Shout your name first so I know who it's going to be guessing. Are you ready? Here we go. Which one of the Prince and Princess of Wales's children had a birthday? Agnes. Yes. Agnes, go on. Charlotte. Correct, Charlotte. She turns nine. One to Prague. There you go. <laughs> well done, you. Congratulations, Agnes. Thank you. <laughs> Paul, I'm gutted for you. Uh, well, well done, Agnes. I wouldn't have got that anyway. Ah, uh, Paul, what's happening this weekend? How's it looking for you? Work, work all weekend. I've got a busy weekend on at work, so I'm just going to do that. I'm, normally, I'd be going through Aberdeen to the football tomorrow, but I've got to. I've got to work, so. Could I just say a quick hello to my friends in Aberdeen, Hopeman, Derry, and especially my friend Andy Harrow. Uh, good luck to your team this weekend, Paul, and have a good weekend at work. Agnes, our winner um, this week on the leaderboard. What are you doing this weekend? Oh, um, nothing much planned, to be honest. Just um, off work, so... That'll be nice. Celebrating your win. Yeah. Do you know your name? Yeah. Producer Caitlin has already put it up on the, the, the board here in the studio. Alfie and Nairn, Mrs. Hood and Hamilton, Gary and Rutherglen, Catherine Glasgow, Liam Coatbridge, June and Bolton, Craig and Dumfries and Galloway, Joanna and Aberdeen, Heather East Kilbride, Roddy and Stornaway. We're right around the country. David and Orkney, <laughs> Sandy and Falkirk. And here she is, Agnes in Stirling, our winner this weekend. Congratulations, Agnes. Thanks so much for taking part right now. Live on BBC Radio Scotland. And listen on BBC Sounds.
News just in. Gavin and Stacey will be back on our TV screens. Ruth Jones and James Corden, who play Nessa and Smithy in the popular series, announced on social media this morning that they are going to be back. How are the fans reacting to what's occurring? Well, they love it. TV critic and broadcaster Scott Bryan is with us to fill us in. Morning, Scott. Good morning. What do we know? Well, I mean, that is happening. <laughs> I think that's literally enough to cause um, a lot of headlines. I think I even saw some of the BBC election coverage interrupted to make way for it this morning. I mean, of course, it's it's huge. I think basically it will most likely, I would say inevitably, answer what happened after that proposal in the 2019 special when uh, Ruth Jones, who plays uh, Nessa, uh, got down on one knee and proposed to Smithy, played by James Corden. The screens then faded to black. We never found out Smithy's re re reply to that. So I guess this will answer that question. Of course, will there be a wedding? Will there be married? Or would he have declined? But it's also, I think, a, a big coup for the BBC. The BBC had an unbelievable number of viewers. 18 million viewers watched that special when it came back in 2019. Um, the most watched, uh, one of the most watched TV moments of the 21st century so far on the BBC when you don't count live sports and, and big event coverage. Um, so clearly they're going to be hoping and riding that this will be another big success again. Yeah, and you don't get viewing figures like that often these days. What we do know is that this is going to be it because the, the mm. picture they posted, Scott, it said the script says, Gavin and Stacey, the finale. The finale, yes. I mean, I think that this is a sitcom that was probably not going to have many more episodes now just because when you revive a show, it is incredibly difficult to try to capture the nostalgia of what made the sitcom so popular in the first place and then keep that going, particularly that this show has a very large cast who... I bet would have moved, um, uh, made everything possible to be in any revival. But, but of course, it's, it's harder to go and stay there for the long term. I mean, I think it's also a a reflection of the streaming age that this show has come back and been um, revived because it did do very well when it was back in the noughties. This this sitcom, I think, came through firstly on BBC Three back in two thousand and seven, then moved to BBC One and had ratings of seven or so million for the um, uh, special back then and then the third and final series. But I think in the last decade or so, it's been a sitcom that has lent itself to repeat viewing. I think also ushering in a whole new generation of viewers who have seen it in the decade since it had ended. And that explains the colossal viewing figures that it then managed to acquire to then get the ratings than it has now. I think for viewers, they'll just be hoping that the screen doesn't fade to black during another cliffhanger. <laughs> if this is the finale, I think people would want all of the storylines to be to be sort of finalised and, and it to have the happy ending that I think viewers would would want for it. But I think it's, I mean, just to get ratings like, like this, I mean, it's also worth pointing out but I think the BBC are going to have a really big Christmas on their hands because not only have they got this, they've also got the return of Wallace and Gromit, which is um, the sixth animation of all featuring the duo and the first since the film in 2008. So the fact that they've got both very popular hits, both happening around Christmas, I think will be a big... A, a big, big um, set of ratings for them. Uh, not even summer yet, but we're already looking forward to Christmas, eh? But what a thing <laughs> to look forward to. Scott, thanks so much for your time, as always. Scott Bryan, they are much more on this on the afternoon show today. Film critic Anna Smith uh, here to talk about it as well. And we'll be playing Brian and Nessa's duet. Remember that Islands in the Stream thing? The comics release single from 2009. We'll give that a spin this afternoon. Afternoon show here today from 2 o'clock. Right now, 11.42 on a Friday morning. It's BBC Radio Scotland.
46 it's time for this it's a weekly meeting of our bad parents club our panel ready to take you through some of the big parenting stories of the week these are parents who are far from perfect they're just you're just doing your best, Billy Kirk. We're trying. Comedian. You're just We're trying. trying, aren't you? Uh, Susan Egglestaff, journalist and mum of one, also with us this morning. Susan, morning. Nah, good she's morning. Ah, there, there, we go, there we go. There she is. <laughs> uh, good to have you with us, Susan. Olympian, I always say as well, just to rub it into Billy. Oh, I do know what I mean. I've I've won a couple of uh, I've won a couple of side races in my town. Didn't you worry about that? A couple of bean bags on my head. That was thirty it. years ago, Billy. It doesn't count anymore. Right, we've got three parenting stories to get through this morning before twelve. Billy, you're up first this morning. What have you got for us? Well, this is to do with the um, the increasing expense of throwing kids birthday parties. Uh, many parents are now getting a bit fed up because the amount of money it's costing. They're getting more extravagant, expensive, and quite frankly, exhausting. Stephen, what's your rule on birthday parties and spending, Billy? Oh, do you know? Like, we, I've got to say, like many, I mean, I've stood there at the side of a of a, um, a school gym assembly hall where there's been a party going on with my uh, dead, dead expression in my eyes, wishing I was in a million different places. <laughs> However, <laughs> uh, we have had a couple in our time. We don't tend to do the thing where we invite all the people at the school. Like, we'll maybe go out for a dinner or have a day and what have you. But i got to say, no, no. I've, I've, I've had enough of quenchy cups. I've had enough of dancing to Eggle Piggle or whoever they turn up with. No, no, no. I think I'm done. I'm done with them. Did, done. You, did you say we'll go out for a dinner? So, in other words, you, you and the missus go out for dinner and take the kids with you. Is but, that what you mean? 
in there. Nah, I mean, me and Mrs. K go out for a dinner. More of a celebration of the life of our children. Well, they're only, they're only here thanks to you, I suppose. Exactly. There's that. Congratulate ourselves. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll sometimes head out where they want to go and get something to eat. Usually, with my kids, it's quite easy. It's like burgers, more burgers and milkshakes. Pff, that's fine. Uh, we'll hit the cinema and we do stuff like that. We do it kind of as a family, really, you know, as opposed to just inviting, you know, Morag and the people that you don't know and uh, including the, the mum who's the, who, the mum of the child that once bumped into your kid in the school oh, playground yeah. and realistically you still hold a grudge. Yeah, it's still that, that grudge is still burning, isn't it? S- Susan, yours is five, so he's going to be in this peak zone for all of this. Is this a party every week? Oh, you are right. This is peak birthday yeah. party zone and I hate it. I cannot wait to be out <laughs> of the birthday party zone. Yeah, it is every weekend. Sometimes it's double birthday parties on a weekend. It's too much for me. Having said that, I'm all for it. They do love it. Yeah. The adults hate it with a passion, very much including myself, but the kids love it. So I can't, I can't grudge it as much as it's probably the worst day of the year for me. I don't mind it when you see their wee cute faces and how happy they are. <laughs> what about the cost, though? I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> how can a five-year-old party cost ten times more than anything I've ever spent on myself for my birthday? So it is. And the thing is, like, you start off, you know, with all good intentions of we're not going to spend too much. Before you know it, you're carried away. And you're acting like you're doing Posh Spice's 50th birthday party like the weekend. It's that kind of price tag, I think. You see, as an Olympian, uh, are you? do you feel that you've got to do stuff that is sporty, that is healthy? <laughs> no. I am all for some bulk buying at Costco yes. or at Aldi of some junk food. And then you kind of, you toss a few grapes on the end of the table to pretend that you're being healthy. But you're not kidding anyone if you think any five-year-olds are going to a birthday party and they're eating carrot sticks. Don't even pretend. Don't even waste your time peeling those carrots. See, she's a good woman, Billy. If it was you or me, we'd be saying, right, uh, I'd be wearing the Olympic medal for a start. And I'd be saying to the other parents, all right, let's have a parents' well, race. I don't have it. Well, oh, we don't, nobody wants a parents' race. What are we t- the, one, the one good thing I will say, though, about uh, doing uh, kids' parties at the weekend is, is when you get to meet the eyes of another parent and go, they'll sleep tonight. They'll sleep tonight. <laughs> Yeah, that happens. That happens, doesn't it? We're going to get Susan's line changed, I think, because there's a bit of a delay on that. So while we're doing that, let me chuck a story in, which is uh, 39% of parents say reading to their children at bedtime is is their favourite part of the day. Of course, we saw Hamza Youssef this week, didn't we? Yeah. At the end of the big day for him on Monday when he resigned, he uh, tweeted a picture of him reading to his daughter, captioned, Today of all days, remembering and being grateful for all the blessings I have in life. So nearly 40% of parents say reading to their children at bedtime is their favourite part of the day. What's what's the favourite part of the day for you, Billy? I mean... If, it, if, if it's involving my kids, I've got I've got two answers to this. First of all, when they're fast asleep. What a time. <laughs> when you know all three, it's like spinning plates. You've got all three of them done at one time. It's like perfect, perfect, which never happens. But the other genuine answer is, is an opportunity to play. You know what I mean? There's only so many, there's only so many uh, summers, there's only so many winters, a chance to get to play with your kids and what have you and get them laughing and being silly and get involved. That hands down, I make time for that each and every day because it keeps us going, Stephen. It keeps us going. When you read to your kids, what do you read to them? Oh, I, uh, well, this is a tricky one because I've got three very different little boys. So you've got uh, the middle son who was his uh, what's his hyperfixation just now. Uh, I think oh, say, what's his name? Uh, oh, what's his bad. name? Uh, yeah, if someone could tweet it in. Uh, the uh, <laughs> let's see, he's into uh, Sam and Max right now, which is a cartoon from the nineties, which just came back. He lo- so I've got reading a Sam and Max graphic novel. Uh, the other one. It's uh, oh, it's not the hungry caterpillar. It's a, it's another one. Uh, the You're really th- not paying attention here. I feel bad, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, and then oh, and the and the eldest, he uh, it's it's a camping book. It's a book about camping that he's into because there's wow. loads of pictures into it. And he's like, we're going camping this summer, Dad. I promise you, by hell or high water, we are going camping this summer. So not really your traditional bedtime goat belly goats gruff kind of a thing. It's a good mix in there, Susan. Thirty nine percent of parents say reading to their children at bedtime favourite part of the day for them what's your favourite part 
Do you know, I actually like first thing in the morning before the mad panic has started because reading to my wee boy is not the relaxing kind of <laughs> half hour that some parents seem to have. I've got to race through the book because my wee boy's trying to like ad lib in every page yeah. and trying to like make some sarky comment on like the picture that's on the page. And so I actually really like the wee hour before school, before there's the mad panic to get out the door. And um, that's possibly because he's up so early. We've got an hour to relax before we start getting ready for school. Maybe if he had a bit more of a long lie, I would maybe not have that luxury, if that's what you call it. And what are you reading to him right now? Do you know, he loves Mr Men books, so he's quite old school. So I've been digging through charity shops for some 1970s Mr Men books. That's a good shout, actually. What time are your kids getting up? What time are you getting up in the morning? This hour of oh. relaxation? What time are you getting up in the morning? <laughs> yeah. I mean, before sex. <laughs> I'm not even going to comment on that. Is, well, you are an Olympian. You are an Olympian. What are you, what are you, no, my God. <laughs> what are you doing up at that time? Um, do you not understand? I do not want to be up before 6 a.m. <laughs> There's somebody screaming through the door. Get up! That's why I'm up. Uh, that's what CBeebies is there <laughs> for. <laughs> CBeebies, for goodness sake, it was made just for that occasion. <laughs> uh, right, let's go on to our third story of the week. And Susan, you've got this one for us. What is it? Well, earlier this week, Joe Wicks, the fitness guy, released a video of his wee girl, who's five years old, in the kitchen with, you know, she was cooking a steak for him in a super hot griddle pan using the sharpest knife I have ever seen in my life. And unsurprisingly, there's been a bit of a backlash from him for, to him letting him, uh, allowing him, uh, allowing his five-year-old to use such a sharp knife. And I've got to say, having a wee boy exactly the same age as that, it gave me the heebie-jeebies because mm. he obviously doesn't think his uh, wee girl needs ten fingers and two hands. He obviously thinks a few missing fingers wouldn't hold anyone back. Oh, I couldn't believe it. And it was one of those super, super sharp knives as well that your hand's off before you've even noticed it. This is one of these tricky ones because you, you want to get your kids cooking, don't you? You want them to be kind of comfortable in the kitchen and all this stuff. You want them to be safe as well. Uh, Billy, what do you think? Well, at least it wasn't an axe. Do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it nearly was. I, I, I saw the size of this thing, Susan, and it was it was ridiculous. I mean, my mum wouldn't even let us in the kitchen. Do you know what I mean? We weren't even allowed near anything. Oh, unless I, when I was eventually given the very difficult job of making my dad a cup of tea anytime he <laughs> thought about sitting down. Uh, I think this is... Ter- I mean, you're kind of... Yeah, you're torn because you want your kids to cook, you want your kids to learn, but... You don't want them to be torn. No, exactly. You want full <laughs> fingers, full compliment of coming out. I mean, it's I just the idea of... Do you know something, son? Get off your Nintendo Switch. Away in the kitchen, do your dad, do your dad a quiche. On you go, just a wee baron. That's what jumped out for me. His daughter, aged five, is cooking her dad a steak. Come on, it's not a good look, is it? <laughs> it's not a good look. <laughs> what are your kids allowed to do in the kitchen, Billy? What would you trust them to do? Well, I've got to say, uh, toast is very much a favourite <laughs> on the menu. It's a starter, it's a main course, <laughs> and a dessert, depending on the topping. Uh, I don't know, they, cook, they, they do cook. I've like, we're baking and stuff like that. They will cook, but I've got to say, the day to day kind of like dinner times, they're not really involved, to be honest. Juice out the fridge. Bit of toast, sandwich, maybe a biscuit for the tin, which is not technically any of those things. I'm not really cooking. It's I'm not really going to get them onto Master Chef. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to. Billy, what have you done for us? I've done you a Nutella sandwich and a party <laughs> ring. How exciting. <laughs> uh, Susan, what's your wee boy allowed to do in the kitchen? Oh, I'm the same. I don't let them need it because, I mean, and I'm all for, you know, you're bombarded with this stuff on social media. Like, let your kids in the kitchen. Let them help. It'll make them into such rounded adults. And I can't take it. I, like, occasionally will let them, you know, chop up a banana with a wee plastic knife and he'll hold the knife like he's a serial killer and then he'll kind of massacre this banana. So, that, I mean, to the point that it's unedible. So if that's what he's doing to a banana with a plastic like, knife, Imagine what you do with a proper knife. So. The most I got Not to do different. when I was a kid was like, I, I used to think that I used to bake with my mum, but I didn't. She just gave me a spoon to lick. Yeah. But that, that was me helping. That was me helping. And you've turned out fine, so... Totally, totally. <laughs> but I could see why you'd be getting grumpy around about dinner time, Susan, because realistically to you, that's the middle of the night. What are you doing? Yeah. The, the, that's true. The, the, the other side to this, I guess, is the is the mess they make as well. I mean, there is the danger, and we should be, we should be across that. But there's also just the chaos left behind when you let children in the kitchen. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, my, my son Maury has now is now doing a, a peanut butter on toast. So, and if anyone knows, if any if there's any bricklayers out there, or 
anyone that does Thailand, you'll know that as soon as that stuff goes hard, oh my goodness, <laughs> it's a night of hiding peanut. I, I'm a grown man, father of three. I'm hiding jars of peanut butter in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hiding them. You don't want to spend the weekend cleaning that mess up, no, do you? No, definitely, uh, definitely not. Susan, what were you allowed to make when you were growing up? I mean, I don't remember being allowed to make anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, clearly this, so this attitude has passed down to me of just don't trust kids basically with any kind of responsibility. And, you know, that's the thing. Like, maybe to be fair to Joe Wicks's wee girl, maybe she was a nice, responsible wee girl. Mammy Boy is not nice and responsible. I don't think I was nice and responsible when I was a kid. So I think that's maybe what I was judged on and should be judged on rather than age-wise. So possibly the fact that I was not a very trustworthy we kid it's why I wasn't in the kitchen either some kids are very very careful aren't they I mean he knows his daughter obviously there's some children that you can trust to do things in a responsible and careful way and other kids are Billy Kirkwood's <laughs> yeah, kids I, I just don't think there's any kids that you should be given a knife to at five I just I, these, I mean let's put it this way there's no four year olds out there getting ready to do my tax return do you know what I mean it's like <laughs> I just think uh, you know yeah take the care if he's gone out his way that again uh, uh, for a bit of balance uh, Joe might have sat down and you know really worked hard with his kid trained safety and all that type of thing but it just seems a bit extreme to go straight from the wee plastic scissors you get in uh-huh. primary school that can't cut nothing mm. absolutely nothing to going here's a Japanese steak knife all the best get that get that steak filleted i wonder if there's any any uh, sponsorship involved by a japanese steak knife company that might possibly there you go there explain you go. some of it uh, billy great to have you with us this morning uh, billy kirkwood comedian yes. lovely to see you. susan eggle staff journalist have a good day see you soon